Hey everyone, welcome back to JRC TV. This week we are hanging out with a brand new special guest, um, someone that I was introduced to literally because a friend of mine read his book, loved his book, and wrote, bought his book, signed it for me, and said, "Hey, you have to read this," and mailed it to me. <laughs> um, and I remember opening up and being like, "Who is this guy?" And I read all about him and learned a ton of great information out of that book. And we have connected to that friend, and recently he just interviewed about my book um, a couple weeks ago. And so now we're going to have a chat today about a few different things that I think you'll find very, very interesting. Um, how to create a program, uh, what's going on in the world, the, the myth of entrepreneurialism, all the people out there who think you know you wake up and have a good idea and instantly you're a massive success. And uh, we're going to demyth some things for you. But welcome everyone to Chris Brogan and Jarek's conversation. So thank you, Chris, for joining us. So happy to be here, Jarek. It's it's amazing how many mutual friends we have. I'm glad that we finally connected. Me too. I, I'm so used to seeing. I know we mentioned this in, in the other interview, but I'm so used to seeing your hair and all the pictures. Um, what 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 happened? You know, I think that um, I, I said that this way today. I said that uh, one of the biggest enemies of thought and learning is calcification. You know, when we start getting entrenched in something. And I was really kind of loving the fact that I had this sort of uh, blonder version of Richard Branson hair. And I, I just really loved that I had this lion's mane and I'd walk into you know businesses and it was really clear that I was not the average other guy at the cubicle. And I just, I just thought, you know what would be neat is just to totally switch perspectives and just shave my head all the way off. And by the way, there's some functional qualities to this, like going to the gym is a little more fun because I don't have to try to wear some hat to keep my hair out of my eyes. Uh, bad is that I live in New England and it's 14 degrees out and my head is freezing. <laughs> Uh, well, you will not have to worry about getting burnt this winter. Um, hopefully, uh, keep the hat on, stay warm there. So, you, I'm excited. Just so everyone knows, you you have a company called Owner Media. Um, can you let everyone know a little bit about what you guys do over there, just so they get some context? Sure. So I tell people that you really can't own the you know your business until you own your life. So what we do is we do tools and courses and things like that about how to grow people's business. And so. Some people say, is that like self-help? And I said, no, because I think self-help often falls into the wish category. And what I try to do is go a little bit further into let's do something category. And it's not also fundamentals of how to be a better accountant. You know, It's more like, what did I wish someone would tell me when I started out of business? What things did people hide from me when I started a business? And, and what kept other people going and how can I help people do the same sort of a thing so I do it through uh, uh, some courses I've written a bunch of books I do a podcast etc so that's why I call it a media and education company because you know I'm sort of a one man uh, a hay house or something I like it um, speaking of books I would love to know and I always ask authors this who've done multiple books I have a friend who's done 22 books in 10 years and my very first question I ever asked him is uh, what's the what's your favorite one that you've written you know, I, I normally don't like my books. I write them and I go, oh, it's awful. You know, oh, terrible. I'm that kind of artist. But um, my favorite book is the newest one, The Freak Shall Inherit the Earth. And I think the reason I like it is because the emails I got afterwards were very much from, you know, I'm 17, I'm in school, and I've been telling my parents this for a long time and they don't believe me, and now I can hand them your book. Or... I'm 50-something, and my kid is just finishing college and really doesn't know where she fits in, and you just said, don't fit in, find where you belong. And, and so it's been a really good thing. And the other reason is that I wrote it for my kids. I have an almost 9-year-old and a 12-year-old girl who I don't think will ever have a cubicle job, and I just really needed to equip them with, all right, well, if you're not going to, here's kind of what you're going to need to think about. And so that's why it's my favorite. Plus, I put bats all over the cover. <laughs> I love it. That's very cool. I, I think um, something you said is something that you mentioned we might want to talk about, which is really fascinating, and it's you know why people create programs. And what I found is, I don't know if you had this experience, but it's, I've talked to a lot of people who are starting up, they're getting into an information type business, that they want to be an author, they want to co uh, create a program, and, and their number one kind of focus on what they're trying to create is, okay, you know, how do I make something that's worth this amount of money so I can sell it and hit these numbers? And I always scratched my head. I was like, wow, that's where you're starting? I mean, obviously that's a good, you know, my business hat is on and I'm making a smart financial decision, but there, there's something really meaningful you just said about why you wrote that book that I think most people 
don't think about when they're trying to create their content or when they're trying to create what it is they want to share with the world. And, and, and I just noticed something you said, which is, you know, you wrote it for your little ones. And what would your perspective be on when people do that? Obviously, you do need to wear a business hat at some stage to, to make sure the numbers will make out and everything's going to be good on that side. But what would be your process as far as taking information and taking ideas and knowledge and experience and wrapping it into something that's deliverable of value to the people around you? It's, it's a super good question. I, I think that I, I tend to look at the work that I create with, with two very simple hats on. One of the hats is how do I help people get further in their business and their pursuits? What do I do to make it better for them? The second thing I do is I, I go through this process of um, how, how can I talk about that from my heart? What does it mean to me? How do I help these people? I never think first about the money part of it. Uh, every time I've ever thought about the money part of it first, I've failed. Every time. Every time I'm like, oh, if I did this, I could make 800 grand this year alone. It would be great because then I'll find 200 more and there's a million. Uh, never worked. Never zero times worked when I started with the money number first. Now, I, I do admit that I get greedy after the fact. I mean, I write something really great. I'm like, okay, well, at this amount and this many, if I sold this many, but then that's a sales challenge. You know what I mean? That's not a motivation challenge. So when I come up with what I come up with, uh, there's sort of a, a couple of three things in mind. Do I know how to do something that someone else might not know how to do? And can I help someone figure that out? Because uh, another thing is transferable information. Michael Jordan can write as many books as he wants about how to get up there and dunk. I, I've got nothing. I have not a skill in my body that's going to get me up and over that rim and into it. Uh, however, uh, books like Joe DeSena's Spartan Up about uh, the mindset of the people that do the Spartan race, that helps me all the time. So then why do I choose to make, say, a course or anything versus a book? Um, a lot of times my books are for people who aren't the kind of people who sit still for a course. And a lot of times my courses are for the people who think a book just doesn't get deep enough. And that's almost always where I split those two, two ideas. So um, I work around similar concepts and all that because I know that it's going to get me to a place where I can be helpful to others. And so I, I, there's stuff in the book that you'll see in my courses. There's stuff in the courses you see in the book. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creative type, so I make more than I use. And so you almost never go, oh, I read about this in the book. I feel you know, uh, miserable. So I think that's important for people too is that, you know, yes, you can repurpose content and yes, it's important to use all parts of the buffalo, which is something I learned from someone you know. Uh, but I can tell you that it, it's also, it's got to feel fresh and it's got to feel like I, I got something different both times. Otherwise, you know, it's going to fall on its face. Absolutely. And if we were to create a general process for people, um, you're someone who's created obviously a handful of books, uh, different programs. What would be a very simple process for someone getting ready to create their very first book or program? What would be a very simple, just kind of basic outline steps they could follow on how to create the idea, how to narrow it down into what works, and how to start structuring it and putting it together into something that they could offer of, of value to people? Because there's lots of people listening to this that have tons of value within them, and they're trying to figure out, well, how do I do it? How do I package it? How do I frame it? How do I create it? How do I deliver it? Well, deliver would be a whole other side, but, but at least the creation side. The way I do it, it might be different than other people. Other people uh, start with a lot of science and they do a lot of uh, online A-B testing. Uh, my friend Derek Halpern comes to mind. He, you know, he's one of those guys that runs ads everywhere. And you know, if more people click A than B, then I'll write about B. I'm not that smart or something. I don't, I don't do it that way. Uh, the way I do it is is this something I think someone else needs and will change their life in some way? I start with that always. Can I be of service? And if the answer is yes, then I think, okay, can I transfer this skill? That's number two. Number three is, all right, if yes, is this a book or is this a course? And, and the, again, the real divider is uh, courses make a lot more money than a book, usually. And so if I, wanna, if, I, if I need to hit certain revenue goals, then I might make it a course. Or if I think it's the kind of thing where you need to marinate it in a bit, I'll make it a course. If it's something where I think you can read it, nod your head and go, ah, I get this, then it's a book. You know, I'm writing a book right now about being an amateur and, and how to be a good amateur. And that's just a book. It doesn't have to be a course. You can, you can get the idea and just run with it. So that's, those are the sort of gates that things fall through. Then what I decide is, is I start right next to like what, what I would consider, a t well, first a title and then a table of contents, so to speak. So even if it's a course, I write out what I think the lessons should look like, and you know, course title names of the lessons. And so then 
the reason I do that is because then I can look and go, oh, you know, it's weird. I think I accidentally spoke about marketing three times, and I really could probably do it once. All right, well, then what else do I need to do? How many weeks is this going to take, and what's the kind of way I should make it look? Now, I have no background in uh, professional education, but I've taken people's online classes that make me fall asleep because I'm just like, can we just get to the good part? And I've taken those ones that sort of like they uh, thrust like the internet in your head and you go, I, I don't even know what to do with all this. So I'm trying for that pace that's somewhere in between and I'm trying for that pace that makes, I, I try to appeal to people with OCD uh, and ADD at the same time. That's my goal. And uh, because I think that we have so many things pulling at us, Jarek, that you know we just, you know, we're in that society. So that's how I do it. And then from there, the real mechanics, I mean, the way I deliver mine are really simple compared to other people. I usually do some sort of a drip email with a little private group and sometimes some video and sometimes some audio to go with it. It's funny, people clamor for video and audio, and then every time I make it, people say, I just wished I had a, a worksheet to go with this. And I said, yeah, that's called writing, and that's what I usually do, and you asked for the video. But, you know, as you well know, you, you try to please the people that you're serving, and then so I'll do the dance and I'll type, whatever makes them happy. Very cool. I love that. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to go through each one of these steps and just ask a couple questions. When you say, you know, the very first thought is, can I be of service? And how do you gauge if it is of service to people? I guess I mostly ask the question, is this something I know well enough that I can tell someone else how to do it. If you said to me, hey, Chris, teach me how to make an omelet, I can make an omelet that you'd be willing to eat. I can't make you an omelet that's going to get you a Michelin star. So, you know, if you said to me, I, I don't know, I just always want to make an omelet. I can bring you in the kitchen. We can get that done. No question. Um, so that's what I mean. And when I think of service, I think, is this going to empower somebody's business in some way? Like, is there, you know, if somebody asks me, how do you tweet? There's never going to be a course by Chris Brogan, how do you tweet? If, how do I use it as part of my personal media to help get people to pay attention to things that I think are more interesting than my tweets? I can help with that. So I, I look for that too. Can I make it more than that? I, I think if you start with how can I be of service or what, what kind of worth can I add or value can I add to somebody else's pocket, you get a much better result than when you think, how much is this going to make me? Absolutely. Um, I, I think there's another piece in there that you were very, very clear on that was important to hear, which is... Uh, and th this one gets under my skin, but you go to so many websites and so many different people's businesses, and it's like, the greatest thing you've ever seen ever, star, five stars, 20 things, look who endorses it, it's the best ever. And you, you're like, wow, this has got to be really good to qualify for that. So you download it, and it's not what you expected. <laughs> Versus what you said, like, listen, um, if, if you're trying to get a Michelin star and you're, you're trying to make the world's best omelet, I'm not the guy. But if you're trying to learn how to cook one, come on in. I'd love to show you. Uh, I, I think that little distinction for people, because so many people try to over-the-top sell who they are and what they have versus being really honest, genuine, and simple and just being like, here's what it is. Here's what it'll do for you. I promise it will over-deliver, and this is exactly what you're going to get. I, I think that's true. I think that... You know, we're surrounded by some really powerful entities. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's been on your show, friend of ours. Uh, Gary's a great guy. There's only one Gary, uh, Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone is Gary on a different scale in Miami or whatever. He's crazy, right? But these people, I mean, that's part of what you're buying. You're buying the theatricality. What I sell is a little bit different. I sell sort of, you know, uh, I, I sell sort of the blue lunchbox. I sell, you know, let's just go to work. Let's open up the lunchbox. There's going to be a sandwich and some milk and an apple. There probably won't be duck. There probably won't be, you know, sushi. But you're going to get fed. And, and I guess the reason I opted for that, uh, it's really funny. A friend of mine, Elizabeth Kana, who's a branding expert, who's, who's done all kinds of great branding stuff, she said that if I were to pin your persona down, it's the regular guy persona. And I said, wow, I love that. You know, I've always wanted to be the regular guy. Even when I had fancy jobs, like when I worked in wireless telecom, uh, I would dress like a construction worker. Uh, and I think it was because I always just wanted to not be something large. I, I love being larger than life. I just love saying, but you can be too. And so I think that's, that's where that all comes from. But also, it's amazing when, when you sell Bombast, you know, you've got nowhere to go but down. And when you sell... Uh, you know, this is just going to do the job for you, most times that's what we want. Most times we just want to get a, a problem solved. And I think Bombast often comes from the fear that we are somehow not good enough 
and, and so the more hype we're putting out there, we're more or less present, presenting our fears to them and saying, hey, audience, I am so afraid, and I'm going to show you just how afraid I am. I like that. Uh, I think the other factor that helps is with the you know logic-driven audience that we have. There's a lot of people here who it, it, they want to know the facts, and they want to know the details, and they want to make sure that if you say it's going to work, it absolutely works as you said. And to be able to reach that audience is so important because they don't, they don't like hype artists. They don't like people who are all pumped up promising the universe and they can barely deliver the state. Like, that doesn't turn out well. <laughs> um, but it, that's, that's very awesome. Um, second question, how do you make some – how do you know if something is transferable? I, I loved your analogy of Michael Jordan and dunking the basketball. Um, but I think some people don't even know any distinctions where they're like, hey and, – and I fell into this category. I remember when I first started coaching, I had done six or seven years of working with dad's company – I came out on my own, and in the first eight months, I did $100,000 in revenue off a really, really poorly designed website. If you would use the Wayback website machine, you can see it, and you'll probably choke on water staring at it. Um, but my you know, hallucination was that's completely transferable. And so I went out and started sharing with people everything I was doing. I was tweeting a lot and staying positive and staying focused. And, and I noticed some of it wasn't transferable just because of the specific situation until I figured out what parts of it were. But I'd love to know for you, how do you know what's transferable and what's not? I'll say that a lot of it came from failing. A lot of it came from thinking something was, like you mentioned, and trying it, and it, it didn't go anywhere. And it was because, you know, I would think, well, of course you have the same drive as me. That's, marketers' number one flaw in life is presuming that their buyer is exactly them. You know, of course you'll buy an ebook. I buy ebooks all the time. You know, that doesn't mean they buy ebooks all the time. So um, the way I go at it now is a lot of times I see can I how bite sized can I make this? How repeatable can I make the process? You know, um, I often ask myself this question: Can the action fit on a three by five index card? If yes, you know, then we've got something, right? Because if the action is something that I can put on a card and you can repeat it off that card. And we're dealing with something. So I always, you know, look for that. I look for the molecules. But the problem I find, and I'll tell you, the number one people who hate what I sell are, uh, like, SEO experts, like search engine guys who are looking for these formulas and algorithms, like literal math, and they're just like, this is baloney. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? You, you kind of can't pick up girls with math either. And they're like, yes, you can. And I'm like, I don't want to talk to you. Uh, so <laughs> I think that... W I'm trying to appeal to sort of romantic crafts people, not necessarily artists, because artists can be like, you know, they can wear steak dresses, and they may or may not make money, and uh, not scientists, because scientists are great, but they're kind of cold, and we need them to make the world better, and I I'm just not them. So I'm sort of looking for the romantic crafts person in the middle. And, and so that's also the question. Is this the kind of thing I could teach to someone who has enough passion to take this thing over the line? Uh, because, again... The sort of person who just shows up to their day job all the time is not my buyer. I, I wish to God it was, but it's the person who's looking, you know, over the wall and saying, "I wonder if there's something else I could be doing that would make my life better." That's that's my buyer. Awesome, and very cool. I, I think this is super helpful for people because I've certainly fallen into some of these uh, pits myself of not doing this correct. I think other people have as well. But um, of course, your book kind of explains yourself. The title. I, I, if you have a formula for titles, I would love to know because we're searching for a title for our new program right now, and bless us. <laughs> uh, I, I am not good in this area. My very first title I ever gave something was the 90-day video coaching peak performance program. And <laughs> uh, Somehow, uh, my friends at Kajabi thought it would sell, so they created this really cool marketing logo for me that, like, you needed a 27-inch Mac just to fit it on the screen across the top to have the logo <laughs> show itself. Um, so if you have a secret formula for titles, I would love to know because that is something I need help with. You have to know that I am the biggest failure at naming that the world has ever known. And um, I, there's like three or four ways that we go wrong with naming. One is that we name something so generic that first off it puts us in a corner. Uh, you know, so that we can't do anything else with it. So you can call your, you know, you might call your program uh, "How to Make a, Th a Thousand Extra Dollars a Month," which is a great title. Like I can see people googling that or whatever. But 
then when you decide to talk about how to make 10,000 extra a month, you're back to square one or something. The other way is you, you, you do that other thing where we, we coin up really strange words that don't much mean anything or we say things like, you know, rational brilliance. And people are like, yeah, okay. What's that do for me? So I always I have one question I always ask was, you know, would a plumber get it right away or would a plumber take two sentences for me to get it? If it takes more than two sentences, I've horribly failed. If they get it right away, it might be too easy. Uh, so I'm always, you know, the reason I changed, my company name used to be Human Business Works. And I, it made so much perfect sense to me. I wanted to teach people how to be human at a distance. I wanted to teach them how to make sustainable relationship-minded businesses. My uh, tagline was tools and smarts for smart people. I thought this all made perfect sense. No one, it was like I had to spend so many times explaining what's human business. I was like, I don't even want to talk to you. So I named my company Owner. And the way I did that was I thought, success is already taken. I don't want success. Greatness is already taken. Lewis owns that. Uh, own. So own your life. I like that. And Oprah kind of has the own network, but no one's going to confuse the two. I don't look as much like Oprah as I used to. Um, so I went with owner. And beyond that, though, I mean, some of my things have hit. Some of my things haven't. My email course is called Love Letters. And people get it right away. They're like, aha, you know, how to do email marketing with love. Um, I did a whole series of things called the owner's heart, the owner's mind, and the owner's path. Everyone hates them. They're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, weirdo. Um, so I'm trying really hard now to make all of my course names or all the project names, not necessarily book titles because there's a little other magic to that, but I try to make them uh, click in someone's head as this, cha this attacks a challenging problem that I have. And I, tr I, I mean, I don't, I, I want to take off the word how-to because that makes me feel sad. But I'm always trying to think, how do I phrase this? Someone will go, that's my problem. And that's how I come up with the titles that I come up with. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, I realize I don't want to, you're sharing a lot of time with us, so I want to be very respectful of that. Um, so we'll probably wrap up in just a couple questions here. The, the one thing that I had recently that stood out to me around titles that might be useful to people listening, and, and I'd love your opinion on it, uh, is a friend of mine was creating something, and he used the thought of, I want to create a title that creates an identity for the person who's going to buy this. And, and it stood out to me. Um, he, I'm forgetting the exact name of his course. Uh, but he used it, and it was like unstoppable entrepreneur. And it, it just stood out because it's like, you know, you know what you're buying. You know what you're, you want to become. It's certainly you know, showing you a future vision of who you're going to become with this program. And, and it, it tells you the whole journey you're about to go on, or at least explains the end point. And I, I really was fascinated by the fact that it created an identity for the person buying it. And so I, I've been kind of scratching through with our names, doing the same thing, and being like, what's an identity that fits our category of people that really truly is what our program delivers, and it fits that identity that someone would buy and be like, wow, like this is who I want to be and who I am. There's a lot in there. So um, first off, it's funny because the reason I chose owner was because I didn't want the word entrepreneur because to some people, an entrepreneur is someone who builds some value and then it cashes out. And so I wanted people who wanted to own and take responsibility and also because I wanted them to realize that they have to also own their life. So my tagline now on my set is you can't own your business until you own your life. I create owners because I think that that integration that people keep throwing away, that alignment between your work and your home uh, is where we all get it wrong. And if we don't have the foundation of home figured out, we're never going to do well in business. We're going to screw it up. Or we're going to go really far and then everything gets you know destroyed. So that's that. The other thing I'm very attentive to, it might be this other guy that we both know who got me started thinking about this. I love positive words. I, I don't go for negative words. So when someone says things like unstoppable, I hear un and stop. And I go, eh, I'm not in love. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm sure it's a great thing. I think it's perfect. I have a bias against negative phrasings because I, I see it like, you know, no and regrets. When someone says no regrets, I'm like, yep, there you are. Two bad words. Um, I, the only uh, exception to the rule is I like the hashtag no excuses, but because it's sort of an internal thing for me and it's something that I've been working on just to make sure that I never allow excuses. And it's just too clunky to say, uh, I will, you know, always pick, you know, the I will always stick to my course or whatever. So that's why. But I find that you're right about the identity. Uh, that's the other thing we do with owners. So human business works. What are you, a human business worker? It just didn't sound sexy. So we wanted a noun so people can be an owner. And that we made shirts and everything. We're like, buy the shirt, you know, because we thought 
people want to be an owner, and that's paid off so far. I mean, that's that, that naming has gone well. So I think you're right to look at identity as part of it. I like that. Um, table of contents, I think, explains itself. The pace in which you deliver, uh, my wife's favorite button on audiobooks is the one that you can listen to it and fast forward. Um, I realized why she talks so fast now. Honey, I know you were going to kill me when you see this. Um, but I realized why she talks so fast at times because she listens to everything in fast forward. So sometimes she talks to me in fast forward. <laughs> um, so the pace is obviously important, and I think she falls into that category where she's like, if you're not getting to the point right now, I'm literally going to stick you in fast forward and listen to everything and hear, a, like, hope I hear something good enough to slow it down and to re listen. So in, you know, in the world. Before we got. Before anybody got book deals, you know, my friends all got book deals around the same sort of time, and it was funny because it was like, "Do you have a blog? Okay, you can have a book," and it was like, "Blogs are the new bands," was the joke around my circle, and a lot of people just tried to translate their blog into a book, and I found that depressing. And then a lot of times, uh, people had no idea what to put in the pages; they just knew it was supposed to be around 200 pages, so they would ju just like doing school reports when we were kids. Uh, they said five-page essay. I'm going to write this word as long as I can write it in pen, right? So um, Julian Smith, when we first ever wrote Trust Agents and then subsequently all the other books I've written, we had one really important thing, which is we read a lot, and we just did not want to waste time with a lame book. So we just said, let's just make as many actionable things as we could do. So the way we make books seem faster is we write actionably, and we try as hard as we can if we are going to tell a story to translate it into now go do this with that story. And that's how we approach that. Nice. I love that. I did the same thing. Um, I, I picked it up from my dad, but the, that thought process of everything you teach has to have something to go do with it, um, which was the whole concept of living it. So you live, apply. Um, the drip email, I, I think we can end on this point unless there's other parts you really want to share with people, but you mentioned that you have an awesome program around um, love letters and, and emailing. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? I know that's not why you're here, but I'd love to know about it and hopefully share it with people that are here. Oh, sure. Well, I, you know, there to me are kind of three schools of how to do email newsletters and email marketing. And one of the schools is no idea, I'll just keep putting stuff in this mail and maybe someone will buy something. And I call that turning poop into gold. Um, you know, you send poop out in the mail and you can't, can't wait for the gold to show up. And strangely, it doesn't. Uh, the other is, um, I call it sort of the Dan Kennedy method, and I don't mean that especially negative, but he's the guy I think of when I think of those guys who say, smash the list as many times as you want. They'll unsubscribe when they're ready to unsubscribe. Don't worry, new people will subscribe. It's fine, just manage the churn. He's made a lot more money than I have made, so I, I can't really th you know swing a fist at that. Um, but when I was doing the Internet Money Masters series, uh, that's what I said too. I said, that's one method, it's just not my method. So with love letters, what I explain, it's a it's a course on e, uh, email newsletters and marketing and all that because seventy percent of my revenue comes from email. So even in all this great social media and even you know having been on things like the Dr. Phil show or whatever, that doesn't make me a dime. I sold no books on Dr. Phil. It was like a fart in the wind. But um, with my email newsletter, I make plenty of money. So or you know enough money. And so what I came to find is that you have to treat the list as very important people. Uh, Jeff Pulver, who was one of my early uh, mentors and bosses, said you live or die by your database. And he meant you nurture that and you, you treat it as if it's your family. He said, you know, the other things that I've worked on is I've worked on a, a really good on-ramping process to make sure people feel like here's what exactly to expect. I'm going to hit you with a sales letter every Tuesday. Sunday is not a sales letter, although I'll mention something I'm selling at the end. Um, Rob is going to send you an email on Thursday. Like We're very explicit about everything you're going to expect. And if we break that, you know, we'll explain even why we broke that trust or whatever. So that's what we talk about. We also talk about what kinds of sequences we have going just for the regular newsletter, not for our courses, for how do we check in with people to see how they're feeling. Because there's another problem that with newsletters that you sort of feel like you got invited to the party one time and the, the host said, oh, hey, and you never see the host again. Uh, or you just have the feeling that the host is talking to the whole room. So I come back around with a, a personalized but automated letter saying, just hit reply right now. Just talk to me just for a minute and give me a feeling how you're feeling. And so those kinds of things we feel uh, keep it going. The other thing we also do is if we notice that you haven't opened or clicked in six months according to our software, we'll pull you out of the list and, and send you on a small sub path that says, 
you know, it looks like you haven't really been getting much out of it. Now, this is software, so we could be totally wrong, and you could be reading every single week. If that's true, click this. If not, we'll probably unsubscribe you in the next two weeks. And it's because we love you, and we don't want to fill your inbox full of junk. And we really mean that, because someone will say to me, well, doesn't that do something with your numbers? I said, yeah. It makes sure that everyone who's getting my mail wants to get my mail, and if they're opening, it's because they opted to get it. I don't, you know, people tell me about their 7 million person list, and I say, what's the open rate? What's the click rate? What kind of clicks are you getting raw number, not percentage? And it's always lower than my crappy, like, 55,000 list or something like that, because I've been culling my list every six months, you know, in perpetuity. So that's how I do it. So that's what we do in Love Letters. And again, the reason was because everyone was saying, well, how do you do what you do? Because for some reason, if I don't get your newsletter when it comes out on Sunday, I'm frantic and I email you saying, is the server down? Did you unsubscribe me? Did something bad happen? And I think as a marketer or a salesperson, that's the best thing in the world. Where's my sales letter, Chris Brogan? That to me is gold. That's victory. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Um, I, I'm excited. I, I think... I'll probably buy a course and go through it myself. <laughs> um, where, just out of personal curiosity, where can I get it? Oh, love letters? Uh, if you go to ownermag.com slash store, I think it's hiding there. And if you can't find it, just drop me a line, chris at chrisbrogan.com, uh, you and friends. I'm always happy to help. I, I also believe that. I believe that customer service should always be us as much as possible. I mean, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs are dying for the day that they can have employees and staff to pawn things off on. But I think every touch with a human better come to me as best as I can. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. I think there's an interesting persona and a perception that went on probably in the 80s or 90s um, where you know it showed status if you had someone else that could respond to people for you and it showed that you were a big deal because they couldn't get a hold of you. And and I, I must have learned it from you in, in one of the books I was reading, but when, when people write in and, and we send out an email, email blast and they write back, I literally make sure I'm sitting by my computer for at least about an hour and a half after and I type right back to them. Yeah. And people are blown away. And I always laugh because I'm like, what are you blown away about? Like, I sent you an email. You sent it back to me. I'm going to respond to you. It just makes sense. It's communication. Um, the person that, that really fascinated me, that blew my mind with that thought, was Tony Shea with Zappos. I, I never forget visiting him and then sending an email to, I think it was like Tony at Zappos.com or something. And he wrote right back. He's like, yeah, thanks for visiting. It was great to see you. Uh, I was like, whoa. I <laughs> sold it for $2 billion, and he just shot me an email. That was nice of him. But he won a fan for life instantly just with the ability to communicate quickly and, and, and just cause that connection. Um, so one more time, ownermag.com forward slash store, love letters. And then it would be right there. It just says love letters. It's got a pretty heart. Beautiful. I'm going to go buy myself a copy. If you're watching this, I highly recommend you do too. Um, and... Uh, looking down this, I, I think this has been immense value for people. Um, you know, is what you're about to create a service, is it transferable? Obviously, figure out is it better a course or a book. Um, the title, uh, something we threw in there was identity, but really making sure that, that it fits what you're about to share with them. One thing that was important, just to recap, was making sure you're not over-promising the universe and, and delivering, you know, peanuts. Make sure that if you say it's peanuts, it's peanuts, and, and if it's the universe, it's the universe but really staying congruent with that. Then you go to the table of contents, figure out the pace you're going to deliver, and then we ended up here with drip email and, and love letters, really making sure you treat them like a VIP, set the expectations right, communicate with clarity, um, and then you visit ownermag.com forward slash store and go buy yourself some love letters. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us for this episode. I don't want to eat up to any more of your time. Thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, if there's any last words or things you want to share with our, our people who are tuning in, I'd love you to. Uh, I will say that, you know, I think that access is the new status. I think the fact that you can be responsive is good. And I would say that sort of alignment where you're the same person all the time is the new authenticity. I mean, never worry about trying to be someone you're not. It's never fun at the end. I agree 100%. Uh, well, thank you so much for everyone who tuned in today for JRC TV. We look forward to seeing you next week for another amazing episode. Until then, have a great week. See you later, everybody.